Right. Hello, everybody. We are coming in today for what is officially our first video of the new year, because I think our last video was back on Christmas Eve, so we are finally coming in for the first video of 2022, and it is officially the first day of February. We didn't really get to nothing in January, but I've concluded that with February, before we go on to some of the other historical topics that I kind of want to get going underway, I want, I reviewing last year, I did not move as far through the presidents as I wished I could have, as I was kind of intending to. So what I want to do here for February, since it's basically a month full of basically presidents, I mean, we have Abraham Lincoln's birthday on the 12th, we have George Washington's birthday on the 22nd, and then we have President's Day, which I don't even know what date that falls on this year. But either way, February has a bunch of stuff with the presidents. And I kind of deem that I want to kind of what we're going to do is name that this February is going to be President's Month. And we're going to try to move at least a few more of these presidents, as many as we can by the end of the month. The goal is to at least get up to Lincoln as we are going on number nine and Lincoln is number 16. So the goal is to get up to Lincoln or right or right, either get right up to him or actually cover him by the end of the month. So that is our goal for this month. This month is officially going to be President's Month. So, as and then I remember that right before we went off in 2021, I did say I was going to do some other videos like the Russian Revolution, I think was mentioned. I will get to that in March. We will push that to then because that also has symbolic meaning given that the Tsar officially abdicated from in Russia, kicking off the Russian Revolution. He officially abdicated in March of 1917. So, that would, at least on our calendars, I mean, that's a whole other prospect if you go to Russia, but we'll explain that when that day comes. <laughs> but since this is going to be President's Month, we're going to go ahead here and do our next president that would be in line. And this is kind of a complicated president because this is going to be really the only president I'm going to be doing that we spend more time looking at their prior history, their prior biography, really than their time as presidency, mostly because... He only served a month. <laughs> he didn't really do nothing as president because he didn't have the chance to. <laughs> so in this case, in this case only, we're going to be focusing a lot more on what this guy's accomplishments were prior to being president because that's literally all we have to go off of. So our ninth president, as you may recall, our last president, the eighth one was Martin Van Buren from 1837 to 1841. We are now moving on to the ninth president. None other than William Henry Harrison. This guy. Remember, I still use this because this just has presidential portrait little cards or whatever you want to call it of each president up to George W. Bush. Once we get to Obama, then we're going to have to do something different. But until then, we have these. <laughs> so we got quite a few more to go. <laughs> but anyway, this is Mr. William Henry Harrison our ninth president, and he's going to be historic first because, as you probably guessed, if this guy only lasted a month because he died, it's also safe to assume he was the first president to die in office, and this is true. He was our first president that died in office, and he was the first, it was the first time in American history, which we'll see here in our next video with John Tyler, who was the 10th president. It marks the first time that a vice president has to assume the office upon the death or assassination of the president, which up until 1841, when this happens, this had never happened before in American history. And because of that, when John Tyler has to take that office, it's a little bit controversial over whether or not he should be called, is he considered a full-on president, or is he an acting president? So we'll discuss that next in the next one. But either way, William Henry Harrison, first president to die in office, and our shortest term president, and he's also at the time, up until Ronald Reagan, he was our oldest president at the age 68. I believe it was 68. I'll have to check. Yeah. He was in his 60s. I'll have to check. Uh, let me see here. I don't remember if 68 was him or Reagan. Yes, he was 68 years old. So, as always, we're going to start off here. Now, in Harrison's case, that's mostly what we're going to talk about here is his accomplishments prior to the office, mostly because he only had a month in office. So, 
we'll go ahead here and just jump right in. So, as always, let's start with where they were born. William Henry Harrison is born on February 9th, ironically that he's born during President's Month. <laughs> he's born on February 9th of 1773 at his family's plantation of Berkeley, which, is, which lo was located near Richmond, Virginia, the current state capital of Virginia. Now, his father was Benjamin Harrison, and his, fa his father was a former Virginia governor, and he was also a signer of the Declaration of Independence. So already growing up, William Henry Harrison is indoctrinated pretty much in American values because of his own dad. His dad was a patriot. He had fought for the cause. He had signed the Declaration of Independence, and he instilled this value into his son. So William Henry Harrison grew up in the one of the first major American families because he's only like two years old when the revolution breaks out and pretty much he never really experiences British colonial rule although he was technically born during that era during the final years now Harrison as he grows up he attends Hamden Sydney College before also studying medicine at the University of Pennsylvania during the 1780s so this would be about when he's mm, late, well, about 18, 20 years old. In 1791, Harrison drops out of college. He decides that it's not really his thing. He doesn't like the higher education life and the sophistication that comes with it. He's not a guy for sophisticated matters. He drops out of college in 1791 to join the fledgling U.S. Army that is being formed, mostly in response to the ongoing conflict in the Northwest Territories with the Native Americans in the Ohio country, as we meant, talked about in our video this previous fall with the Ohio Indian Wars. Harrison is actually ends up being a veteran of this conflict. He joins in 1791, ironically the same year that Arthur St. Clair has his disastrous defeat at the site of future day Fort Recovery in modern day Ohio on the Wabash. Harrison becomes deployed to the Northwest Territory after he joins the U.S. Army in 1791 and takes part in the Ohio Indian Wars. He is present at the Battle of Fallen Timbers in 1794, in which the U.S. Army wins, crushes the Native American resistance in Ohio. Basically, they afterward, they signed the 1795 Treaty of Greenville with the Native American tribes, and the Native Americans are restricted to the Northwest quarter of the state. It opens Ohio to settlement. And at the same time, Harrison, for his service, gets promoted to captain and is put in command of Fort Washington on the Ohio River, which is modern-day Cincinnati. So Harrison very much, and we're going to just go through here, Harrison, he was an army man a majority of his life. He was a military guy. He built his life on a military career. And it started fighting the Native Americans in the Northwest Territory during the Ohio Indian Wars back in the 1790s. Excuse me. In 1795, Harrison ends up marrying Anna Toto Sims, the daughter of a local judge in near Fort Washington, near Cincinnati, Ohio. They end up having ten children. Uh, however, six of them end up dying before 1841 when Harrison himself dies. And his son, John Scott, would later be the father of his grandson, Benjamin, who we will also discuss about in the future because Benjamin also becomes a president. He becomes the 23rd president, Benjamin Harrison. And this is the only case in U.S. history where you have, as we all know, the, the Bushes were father and son, and some might even recognize that the Adams were also father and son. This is the only case in American history where we have a grandfather and a grandson become president. So we will be talking about him in the future. Now, Harrison ends up resigning from the Army in 1798, just about when tensions are ratcheting up of France overseas over violations of American trading rights, mostly due to the aftermath of the French Revolution. But he ends up being appointed the Secretary of the Northwest Territory upon his resignation by President John Adams. Out in 1799, he becomes the Northwest Territory's first congressional delegate to Congress. He doesn't really have he doesn't have voting power though. He's just the delegate. He gets to be the representative of the territory to Congress, although he has no voting power. Kind of like per, the Puerto Rico representative. They have a representative in Congress, but they have no voting power in congressional votes. They just they kind of sit there and watch. <laughs> 
In 1800, he becomes governor of the newly created Indiana Territory as the rest of the Northwest Territory, other than Ohio, is kind of set aside and renamed the Indiana Territory as the big chunk that's going to become the modern-day state of Ohio is officially named the Ohio Territory, as Ohio is now reaching the point that it's about to become a state in three years. The population has grown to that size. As governor of the Indiana Territory, Harrison negotiates many treaties with the local Native American tribes in order to obtain millions of acres of land for white settlers. This kind of gains Harrison the reputation of a dealer, but at the same time it gains him the reputation of an Indian fighter because when the tribes resisted selling their land to Harrison, he would forcibly call the army in to remove them. So either sell your land, I can give you I can give you some money, or I'll just take them by force and push you off it. So either way, you're losing the land. So to Native Americans today, Harrison is probably not seen that very favorably due to his behavior. But back in the day, he had this reputation of being a deal breaker and a deal broker, and he had the reputation of being an Indian fighter because he would forcibly force these Indians off their lands. Now, Harrison's actions in the Indiana Territory, about right where Indiana is today, has the adverse effect of only strengthening Native American re further Native American resistance to white settlement, particularly in the form of Tecumseh's Confederacy that ends up forming in the early 1800s by the Shawnee chief Tecumseh and his brother. Now, Tecumseh was very much against Harrison. He knew who Harrison was, and to my knowledge, they did actually meet on two separate occasions and had a conference. And on one occasion, the delegate comes to come with his warriors into a peace conference at a manor, and Harrison had come with the army, and a couple well more wealthy society members wanted to come watch. And he had tried to push Tecumseh, Sell these lands to me, and it will be the last tree we have to make. Just make, just give us one last entitlement. That's all we need, and we'll leave you alone. Tecumseh, who was himself a veteran of the Battle of Fallen Timbers of the Ohio Indian Wars, knew that the United States had broken numerous treaties with the Native Americans when they had said that, oh, we, no, we won't need any more land if you sell this to us. We'll stop. We won't move anymore. Well, then they break that treaty, and then they want more land. Tecumseh knew this. And he called Harrison out in front of them, basically telling them that why one last agreement, every treaty that you have made with us since you guys came here, you promised us would be the last, but yet you still keep coming. <laughs> so why would I sign one? Because he basically was decrying the whites as liars, they're thieves, and they're not to be trusted. And he would ref he refused to sign any treaty with Harrison. Now this kind of ticked Harrison off. He was not that happy with the result because he was used to getting his way. But now he had an Indian chief who very much did not want to cooperate with him, who actually had some guts to stand up to him. And this was not something he was accustomed to. And this only intensifies this r sort of rivalry that grows between these two leaders of the respective sides of the conflict. Now, Tecumseh's main base ends up being his, the little vi the Native American village of what they call Prophetstown, which is located in what was in the Indiana Territory in modern-day Indiana. This was where he had the headquarters of his confederacy. Now, Tecumseh would often travel south and west and even to the east a little bit to try to negotiate personally with the other tribes, getting them to try to join this confederacy to resist further white settlement of their lands, to push the Americans back east. And while he was away, his brother, the prophet, as we'll call him, because his real name is like Tenaskatwata, or however they say it, I cannot say it. It's a, it's a long name, and I'm not Native American, I don't speak it. <laughs> but his other name was known as the prophet, and he would stay at Prophetstown, kind of just holding down the community when it comes to would go on these long journeys. Harrison learned about this, and he knew on one occasion, in 1811, he knew that in December of 1811, he got word that Tecumseh was going south, that he was absent from Prophetstown. Harrison was so fed up with Tecumseh and trying to break this Native American resistance at this point because they were refusing to sell their lands now, he wanted to basically send a message to Tecumseh that, back down or I will get rid of you. And in December of 1811, he sends the U.S. Army to attack the Native American village of Prophetstown in Indiana Territory. They end up destroying and burning the whole village down, and the Native Americans are forced to flee. 
including Tecumseh's brother among them. This becomes known as the Battle of Tippecanoe because there is that small skirmish with the Native Americans briefly until the Native Americans realize that the army kind of outnumbers them and they just full-fledged retreat instead of getting killed. This further enhances, to, not Tecumseh's, but Harrison's uh, image as an Indian fighter that he is fighting for the good of white settlers against these savage Native Americans, which is not true. They're not savages. They're people. They're human beings. But this was what was fought back then. Now, when the War of 1812 begins, in 1812, as we've start discussed before, and in case you need a reminder, in June of 1812, due to ongoing disputes with Britain over territory, sovereign over territorial sovereignty, over backing the Native American resistance within their own borders, over trading rights and seizure, impressment of American sailors on the high seas, forcing them to serve in the Royal Navy to, in order for, to fund Britain's effort against Napoleonic France. The United States declares war on Great Britain for a second time in June of 1812, the second time that we went to war of Great Britain, the War of 1812. Now, when the war breaks out, keep in mind, Harrison is still in Indiana Territory in Ohio. He's in that general area. He's on what it basically becomes the Western Front because this is the frontier of the United States, and the British actually send Native American and British Army battalions and whatever they have down through the frontier in the hopes of getting into Ohio and pushing in from the West. So Harrison, when the War of 1812 begins, he's still retired from the Army up until that point. He rejoins the Army when the war breaks out, and he is automatically promoted, granted the rank of a Brigadier General, and is put in charge of the Army of in Ohio and the Northwest Territory. Now what happens is Harrison serves well in this capacity. He thwarts two British invasions of Ohio during his time, which I've been to the site of one of his forts, and that was up at what is called Fort Meigs, up near modern-day Toledo. It's actually in Perrysburg, but it was on the Maumee River, and the Maumee was like the big frontier. If the British got across that river, they would be able to f just swarm into Ohio. Well, he built this fort right at the Maumee River Rapids, the shallowest point of the river where the British would have to cross it at. And the British laid siege to this fort twice in 1813. They failed on both occasions. The second time, they tried to go a little bit west and take a smaller fort at Fremont. And this also failed. Modern-day Fremont, modern Fremont. I mean, back in the day, it was uh, Fort Stevenson, I believe. But he basically forts. Harrison's leadership enables the U.S. Army to push the British out, back out of Ohio for good in 1813, ending any threat of a Western invasion. And then, in a stunning feat, Harrison goes north into what the British occupied Michigan, takes Detroit back from the British, then heads into Canada and to, onto the Ontario side of Lake Erie and wins the Battle of the Thames in October of 1813, in which basically ends the conflict in the Western Theater, and at the same time, Tecumseh, the Indian chief who had been Harrison's big rival on the Native American side, he ends up being killed in this battle. So this also ends a bunch of the Native American assistance and resistance, because A, the Native American's leader is now dead, they don't know why they're siding with the British, at the same time, they have no leadership, they have no organized resistance to further white settlement of their lands because Tecumseh is not there to kind of guide them. Now, Harrison resigns from the army in 1814 after winning the Battle of the Thames in 1813. He deems that he's done his duty. The Western Front is secure. Now, in the East, it was still going on, but he doesn't really bother with the East. He stays in the West. And Harrison resigns from the army in 1814 and moves his family out of the Indiana Territory to a farm in North Bend, Ohio, just near the Ohio-Indiana border. It's right on the Ohio River and just west of Cincinnati, I believe. Again, we're going through our wonderful little notebook. In 1816, the war ends in 1814. The last battles technically fought January of 1815 due to just the t delay of time that take took for, you know, news to get from Europe to the Americas. But in 1816, the war is over by this point, and Harrison becomes elected as, the rep as a representative from Ohio in the House of Representatives. 
starting a career in politics now. He's no longer, he's exited the army military career that he's held since the 1790s. He is now going to enter politics, which will kind of take him into the end of his life. In 1819, Harrison becomes a senator in the U.S. in the Ohio State Senate before he runs for U.S. Senator from Ohio and wins, and he does this in 1825. Harrison resigns his U.S. Senate seat from Ohio in 1828 in order to become a U.S. minister to Columbia for about a year under President uh, John Quincy Adams. Now, the problem with Columbia, Columbia at this time, the Latin American nations and South American nations are gaining their independence from Spain. And the United States automatically sees this as a triumph over European colonialism, that this is a triumph of their ideals because these nations are trying to set up democracies. And they basically issue the Monroe Doctrine saying that the United States will view any European nation that tries to colonize anywhere in the Western Hemisphere as an act of hostility towards the United States, and it will defend its, in its interests and those of any nation from European influence. So they send Harrison, this renowned military career guy who has this innate knowledge, to Colombia, which has just gained its own independence from Spain not about 10 years prior. And Harrison is not very impressed with Colombia at all. He's very much, he, the Colombian leader, I'm trying to think what his name was, Simon Bolivar, he's not impressed with him. He sees him as a dictator. He sees him as not fit for leadership, that he's weak, the Colombian army's weak, and he actually offends the Colombian people while he's down there. And within a year, President Adams actually has to recall Harrison because he's just not, I mean, he was a minister, but he's not a good minister because he's not fostering friendly relations. He's only antagonizing the people that he's supposed to be helping. So in 1829, he is recalled back to the United States. Now, in 1836, Harrison enters the presidential race as the nominated candidate for the newly formed Whig Party. And this Whig Party was the big second national party in the United States to, for, to come about since the uh, collapse of the Federalist Party. I mean, what happens here is the Federalist Party of the 1790s and the Democratic Republicans of the 1790s, they kind of go on until the late 1810s and the Federalists kind of go extinct. There's no succeeding party that succeeds them, mostly due to the American public's perception that they're traitors due to their behavior during the War of 1812, where they had even flouted that New England should secede from the United States because it was so opposed to the war. After the war is done, people kind of view the Federalists as traitors, and they have no, they don't want nothing to do with them anymore. So by 1820, the Federalist Party is it's extinct. It's gone. The Democratic Republicans are left that Thomas Jefferson had originally formed, but they start to fracture as well. And in 1824, they really get fractured when the election of that year comes about because you have John Quincy Adams, and then you have Andrew Jackson, who have their own supporters, and they kind of split the Democratic-Republican Party in two. In the faction that goes with Jackson, his supporters become the Democrats, the modern-day Democratic Party. I mean, not the modern-day, because it's definitely – its issues back then were a whole lot different. But technically, this is the same party. It's just the, the issues have changed since. On the other side, the former Democratic Republicans that went against Jackson, that could not stand Jackson – they they kind of conform and regroup, and they form what is known as the Whig Party, which is the predecessor to the Republican Party. So the Whigs, the Whigs come about in the eight, late eighteen and during the eighteen thirties, during Andrew Jackson's presidency in particular, in opposition to his policies and behavior. And in eighteen thirty six, Jackson has run his two terms; he can't run anymore. And he not he basically appoints that Martin Van Buren should be his successor, his vice president. Well, of course, the Whigs are not wanting a continuation of Jackson's policies, so they put forward a well-known candidate. They put forth Harrison, the military hero of the War of 1812, and they put him as their candidate for the 1836 election. Now, Harrison does not win the 1836 election. He loses it to Van Buren. However, Van Buren... It will get a rematch against Harrison in 1840. 
because Harrison runs again in that year, he selects John Tyler of Virginia as his running mate to run with him that year as the president on the Whig presidential ticket as a balance because Harrison is from Ohio, he's from the North, and then you have a Southerner on the ticket. Democrats mocked Harrison during the 1840 presidential campaign. They pr they mocked him for being too old. You're in your 60s. You 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 won't be able to fulfill the duties of office. And they also stated that give him a and this is a quote, give him a barrel of hard cider and a pension of two thousand dollars, and he will sit the remainder of his days in his log cabin. As basically saying that Harrison's old, he'll sit there and do nothing if you give him the p money and the pension that comes with the presidency, and you give him a drink, he'll do nothing. The Whigs end up turning this attack around into the first log cabin campaign. This appeal, this appeal that Harrison is from the frontier, that he grew up in a log cabin, even though he really didn't. <laughs> he grew up on a plantation. <laughs> but they give this appearance that, oh, he grew up in a log cabin, he grew up on the frontier, he's had to work his way up through life, through the military, he's had to work for what he's been given. And that Van Buren is this traitorous, rich aristocrat who is to be blamed for the economic crisis the nation has been experiencing since 1837 with the panic that happened. They blame Van Buren for that, and they blame him because, oh, he's an aristocrat. He's rich. He don't care. He don't care about the common people. And the Whigs turn this into that kind of a campaign. Harrison gets the nickname of Old Tippecanoe also because of his Indian fighting during his military career against Tecumseh during the Battle of Tippecanoe, and his supporters actually used log cabins and hard cider as campaign memorabilia. And this also awakens the word, I did not know this until I actually looked this up, the 1840 presidential campaign between Harrison and Van Buren ends up giving us the word booze for another term for alcohol, which I did not know that. Apparently, the E.C. Booze Distillery, spelled B-O-O-Z, released log cabin-shaped whiskey bottles in support of Harrison's campaign that year, which led to booze, the word, becoming a common American term for alcohol because of how popular Harrison was in this election, that people, like, they seen that booze gave them the whiskey-shaped log cabin bottles. Oh, it's booze! And eventually, somehow, that came to just be a general term for alcohol in the American consciousness. Now, Van Buren, as mentioned, he was blamed for the mismanagement of the economy since 1837 when the market crashed, even though that was technically more of Andrew Jackson's fault and Van Buren had just kind of come into office at the wrong time. But nonetheless, the people blamed him for it. And because of that, the Whigs painted Van Buren as this misguided, out-of-touch, wealthy elite who will do nothing to help the common man, while Harrison, who supposedly grew up on the, as the common man, oh, he'll do everything for you. Even though, in truth, it was actually the opposite. Harrison, keep in mind, Harrison had been born on a wealthy plantation. He had been handed, he had gone to college for part of his life. He had been a high-ranking military officer. Van Buren had actually been born in a log cabin. He had been born in a up in northern new york his family had not been wealthy he had r rose from rags to riches where harrison was very much that he had started out rich reality was much different than what was painted in the end of the 1840 election harrison ends up gaining out of the electoral votes 234 votes compared to van buren 60. He gains 53% of the popular vote compared to 47% for Her Van Buren. Harrison wins the presidential election of 1840. He is inaugurated on March 4th of 1841 at the age of 68 years old. He, this means that he is the oldest until Reagan in 1981, who I think took the Ovo office at age 69, I believe. And then that was superseded in 2016 by Donald Trump, who was, I think, what was it, 70 four or so, 73. I could be off, but he was in his 70s. And then that was superseded just last year when Joe Biden took office because he's like a year or two older than Trump is. <laughs> so Harrison then proceeds at his inauguration. He gives a, an address, as every president does at the inauguration. They give an inauguration address. At his inauguration address on March 4th of 1841, Harrison gives his address is over eight is 8,445 words long. Talk about writing out a daytime opera. <laughs> and he gives what becomes, and is still to this day, 
is the longest inaugural speech ever given by a president, despite the fact that the speech lasts an hour and 45 minutes, and it is freezing cold, and it is raining. Harrison did not wear a coat, and he did not wear a hat. He's 68 years old. He gives an hour and 45 minute speech without wearing any kind of protection in the bitter cold and rain. That is not a good combo. Within a week of his inauguration, Harrison develops a cold that quickly progressed into pneumonia because of his exposure to these elements without taking any proper precautions. He ends up dying on April 4th, one month after taking office. And he's actually the first to die in office, as we mentioned. The pneumonia is what ends up killing him. He dies on April 4th, a month after he takes after his inauguration. John Tyler then succeeds Harrison as president, as vice president, and that kicks off a whole nother load of controversy that we will be discussing in the next video. Harrison's widow, Anna, as we may remember, who he married back in 1795, she receives the first pension from Congress that there has ever been in U.S. history and a one-time payment of $25,000 and free postage on her mail for the rest of her life. This, in fact, 25000 might not, I mean, that is a bunch of money, but even back then it was even more money. She was set for life, pretty much. And this, it was courteous of Congress to do this. This had never happened in American history, and there was a lot of outpouring for Anna that she had had this happen to her. I mean, this shocked the nation. This had never happened. We'd never seen, what do we do if the president dies? And now we were going to have to find out. Anna died in 1864 during the Civil War, and she, is, she would end up being buried with her husband at their tomb in North Bend, Ohio. So that basically... As mentioned, he's not really a long president. I wasn't even sure we we're going to have a long video on him. And by the looks of it here, we got like 31 minutes. So, yeah. <laughs> it's hard to talk about a man that really didn't get to make that much of his mark of an impact on the presidency. But we do have a couple of images here for you. We have an image, an earlier portrait of Harrison during his service, updated to look like his service during the War of 1812, shortly after the war ended, with his military uniform on. Here we have a drawing of Tecumseh, an illustration, the Indian Native American Shawnee chief that had kind of opposed Harrison in the Indiana Territory, who was very famous in the Northwest Indian Wars who ended up being killed in 1813 at the Battle of the Thames, which Harrison also fought in. Map of the electoral map of the election of 1840, showing just how much Harrison won. The yellow are the states that the Whig Party took of Harrison, the blue are Van Buren. As we can see, Harrison kind of just crushes Van Buren in the election. He absolutely crushes Van Buren, and he has no problem securing the states right here of Ohio and Indiana and even Michigan, where he very much had just kind of, he had served as governor out there for years, so these people knew him well. The only one that he really doesn't get out here is Illinois. Ironically, he didn't capture his home state, mostly because he had adopted Ohio by his home state. By then. And if you look at Ohio, most Ohio... Well, they'll claim that Virginia has the most presence of any state. Yes, they do, and Ohio is technically second, but some Ohio historians are, they like to include Harrison as an Ohio president. Others don't because he wasn't technically born here, but most will because of the factor that he adopted Ohio as his home at, since the 1790s onward, pretty much, and this is where he died, So, and this is where he ran from during the presidency. He ran from Ohio. And then we have a final picture of the tomb down at uh, North Bend, Ohio, just west of Cincinnati that you can go to, and this is where he's buried today. He's buried at the tomb. Anna is also buried there, and I believe their son John Scott is also buried at the tomb with them. It's on the top of a small hill called Mount Nebo. So that basically wraps up for William Henry Harrison again. Not a long video because he wasn't a real long president. But that basically wraps that one up. Our next video, of course, will be, as we move here through the President's Month, as we get going here, it's going to be on John Tyler, who becomes a unique president because where Harrison is the first president to die in office, 
Tyler is the first vice president to have to assume the office, and he has a lot of challenges when that happens. He's also the first president, I believe, to get married while in office. So we'll have to discuss that in our next video here with him. So that wraps up for today. Hope to God I don't get snowed in because we're supposed to get a snowstorm. <laughs> I hope no one else that lives in Ohio gets buried with that thing. Ohio, Indiana, wherever that thing's going to hit. They're calling for supposedly up to two feet, but we'll, I guess we'll see because we know how meteorologists are. It's the only job you can have and be 10% right all the time and still have a pay job. <laughs> The only, it's the only job that you can legitimately be wrong at 90 or 80% of the time and still have a pay. <laughs> still get a paycheck. But, nonetheless, I, dig I digress. That wraps it up for today. So, as always, like, subscribe, leave any comments or questions that you have down in the video. I'll be happy to answer them. Any suggestions, as always, leave them down in the comment section of the video. And we will see you all here later this week or next week when we get the John Tyler's video. So, as always, stay safe, stay warm, and may God bless you all.